Hello everyone, this is Kevin from Skywatcher, and uh, let me pull on my webcam. There we go. Good morning everyone, this is Kevin Lagore from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast, and we do this every Friday, um, 10 a.m. Pacific time. It's normally about an hour, so we're uh, hoping we'll have a good show. Uh, we have our good friend uh, that's joining us today from Software Bisc. This is Richard Wright who is a renowned imager, speaker, author, um, and the list continues to go on and on and on. And uh, we're happy to have him here today. And uh, Richard's going to be talking how to pick your, your camera for astrophotography. And we'll have plenty of uh, time for questions at the end of the webcast. Uh, but Richard's going to be doing most of the talking today. He's got his own uh, talk going on. So I'm gonna give Richard the floor, and uh, here we go. So, uh, hey Richard, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, how are you guys? Or how are you, I should say. Good, <laughs> good. I'm wearing my Hawaiian shirt. There we Ron go. Feature if he's watching. <laughs> Let me get there. We go. You have full screen now, and I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna shrink myself because I'm actually in the way. So let me. Uh, whoop! There we go. Um, okay. So I am actually gonna hand this over to Richard, and Richard's gonna be taking over the PowerPoint. I'm I might make myself disappear real quick. That way okay. you guys can see all of his um, presentation. So Richard, you have sure. the floor. They're just slides. All right. Well, thank you for everybody. Um, if uh, I'm going to invite Kevin uh, also to interrupt me if the uh, sound, if we have any internet glitches, and I'll I'll go back and try to repeat um, anything that that I need to. Uh, but Kevin did a good job of introducing me. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just a little bit about myself and why uh, I'm talking about this topic. Uh, I've worked for. Uh, software BISC uh, for the last 20 years, uh, both uh, full-time and part-time, and uh, probably will be working with them in a capacity for the next 20 years as well, I hope. Uh, I, and, and a great thing about my job is I do camera plug-ins, uh, so they've, they've been really great about subsidizing my um, sickness uh, for astrophotography, uh, so they're sort of like the patron saint of my astrophotography hobby. And uh, I'm a software engineer. I am not a hardware guy. I, I went to uh, University of Louisville Speed School to do engineering, math, and computer science. And I actually went into electrical engineering for two semesters and decided I liked software better. Um, it basically, software is better behaved. I can just delete it and start over, and there's none of that smoke uh, smell uh, afterwards. Um, but writing camera plugins, uh, I have to get these cameras working. We have our own cross-platform uh, device uh, architecture, uh, so we can't just plug into uh, you know a ready-made made set of ASCOM things. Uh, the cameras need to work on Windows as well as the Macintosh, and uh, also on Linux now. Uh, and so I, of course, I have a familiarity with a lot of the cameras and architectures and how they work, and also as an imager for uh, you know, more than a decade, uh, well, almost two decades now, uh, you know, I, I got some experience with that. So it's really nice when your profession and your hobby can overlap like that. Uh, and that's, that's really great. I, um, I'm on Instagram and um, Twitter. If you want to follow in my exploits, it's just accidental astro or at accidental astro. And I also do a, a monthly blog on imaging for sky and telescope magazine uh, on their website, skyandtelescope.org slash astrophotography. And my gallery is um, here at um, eveningshow.com. So uh, I've written most of the camera add-ons for the Sky Professional. And so uh, this is sort of another day at the office. This is one of those, you should not be imaging like this photos. But I had you know, a clear night and I needed to go through several cameras and try things out. And um, there's nothing quite there's no better laboratory or, or than the night skies so i really love working from the backyard on a nice cool evening and i can debug code under the stars um, it, it's very nice and uh, you as you can see here i've got quite a variety of cameras uh here that i'm looking at and the thing is the most 
you know, being the camera guy, so to speak, you, people have a lot of questions about cameras. And strangely, the number one question is not, uh, you know, how do I maximize USB bandwidth by, you know, optimizing packet size? It's usually things like, you know, should I go color or mono? Uh, you know, can I get a cool camera? The uncooled are so much cheaper. What, uh, what does all this stuff mean? Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords about, uh, you know, in marketing material. And, and what are these things, you know, what, what, how do they affect your camera's performance? And, you know, what are the sorts of things that you should look for when you're comparing cameras? And what I like to do is go back to first principles. Uh, sure, I will tell you what camera I use all the time, uh, but that's, that's not necessarily helpful unless you, you, you also live here in Florida where I live and you also have the same kind of telescope I have and you also have the same sort of objects that you're interested in. Um, and if you're gonna shoot planetary or galaxies or emission nebula, all of these things affect your choice uh, of gear. And so I like to boil things down to so I think if you're well-educated on the foundation, you can make an informed uh, decision for yourself. And science just, it always trumps opinion, whether it's, you know, you're, you're, you're following Twitter feeds or cloudy nights or, uh, you know, Facebook forums. Um, you know, what it boils down to is, you know, in engineering terms, uh, how do we how do we measure a real camera's performance? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's be honest. You can really make up for uh, a camera's performance quite a bit when you're a whiz at Photoshop or PixInsight. Uh, but getting the best data to begin with always makes that job uh, a little bit easier. One of the most fundamental uh, enemies to good images, of course, is noise. And so a lot of times I'm going to say this affects your noise. And so I want you to just kind of, this is what noise looks like. It's this horrible grainy looking stuff uh, in your, and this is actually my very first image ever of M13 taking about uh, 20 years ago at the Winter Star Party. Um, I'm not even gonna tell you what equipment I was using. It was quite, it was quite hideous. Uh, but you know, over time you start to get a little bit better. And <clears throat> the longer you expose, the more data you gather, you get more signal it's sort of counterintuitive to a lot of people, but you also get more noise. So that's right, the longer you expose, the more noise you get, uh, but you also get more signal. And the signal though grows faster than the noise. And so the, the, key, the key thing we're looking for is the signal to noise ratio. The higher the signal noise ratio, the better quality of your image. It's really the only true objective metric of image quality is what is the signal uh, to noise ratio. And you can improve that by lowering the noise. Uh, and there are some things you can do to your camera to lower the noise. Uh, you can improve that by raising the signal. And there are things you can choose about your camera that raise the signal. Everything we do is aimed at increasing uh, the signal to noise uh, in, our, in our images. Now, arguably, contrast is of nearly equal importance for image quality. Uh, but contrast has more to do with your optics. Like if you have a very fine Esprit refractor, uh, you're going to get good contrast. If you have a very, uh, you know, uh, anyway, we won't get in too much into that. But really the contrast has more to do with your, your optics than it does with, uh, with the camera choice. So we're mostly focusing on signal to noise uh, for images. A term that you'll hear oftentimes is ADU, analog to digital units. And what that is, is a count of photons. Your camera is made up of pixels and each pixel is like a bucket collecting photons or like a bucket collecting rain. And the raindrops are coming from a galaxy far, far away or from your nebula or from the moon or from the sun. And you've got a little counter. Each pixel is just going one, two, three, four, as it receives, uh, as it receives uh, photons. And that number is called, uh, we call the ADU. Now, some of the purists will call that digital number. I think that's more of the uh, hardware engineers. I want to call it a digital number. And a lot of the software people uh, usually call it ADU or analog to digital uh, units. Now, your camera's gain is how you convert the count of electrons into the ADU. So if you read 50 ADUs out of the pixel, you don't necessarily necessarily get the number 50 in your image, they apply some gain to that, where they multiply that number of electrons to get a larger number. And strictly speaking, gain doesn't make your 
camera more sensitive, but it can in the sense that it can get some of the very low signal up above the read noise. It depends on where the gain is applied. Sometimes the gain is applied on chip. Sometimes the gain is applied by the surrounding electronics. Sometimes the gain is, is applied in multiple stages. And between each of those stages, different sources of noise uh, can, be, uh, can be introduced. But this, uh, this noise from the, from the read noise uh, is an important metric uh, also for camera quality. But your gain can affect your read noise. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. Now, Unity Gain is a, is a name that has a lot of names to a lot of different people. Uh, most engineers call Unity Gain uh, when the gain is one. So if you read out 392 photons counted, then the, the pixel element in your image is going to be 392. It just means we didn't apply any, any gain to that value at all. Usually we apply the gain to spread your counts from the pixel out to fill the 16-bit range. Now, a 16-bit number, when you read raw data off a camera in your FITS file or in your camera raw file, they're usually stored in a 16-bit number. Now, 16-bit is a bit head thing. And so somebody who went to, you know, studies software engineering since the 1980s, this is very intuitive. But to a lot of people, it's, uh, it's a little bit mysterious. Basically, a 16-bit number means you have the full range 0 to 65,535. So you have a great deal of uh, fine uh, gradation between uh, brightness values, and you can collect all of those photons and spread that out. Now, if, you're, if your chip can only read a number up to, say, 2,000 or up to 20,000, we like to spread that number out across so that it matches to 65,000. And so we'll adjust the gain. CCD manufacturers typically hard code the gain into the camera's firmware so that this, what we call the full well capacity, is spread out across the full 16-bit range. A lot of CMOS manufacturers leave this up to the user. And I won't get on that soapbox, but I actually think that's a mistake. The, the best way to set the gain for your CMOS camera is to overexpose it and see what your saturated values are uh, using the imaging software of your choice. And then adjust the gain so that your saturated value is up in, you know, around 65,000. It may not come out exactly 65, 535 uh, based on different things in the camera. It may, it may peak at 60,000 or at 64,000. But you want, you want to get your, 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 your image data to be across that, that range as much as possible. Another important metric for cameras is it's called quantum efficiency. And I started talking about this because I was talking to a friend of mine about the quantum efficiency of different chips. And they thought I was making that term up, like I was pretending to be Doc Emmett Brown or something. And like, no, that's a real thing, quantum efficiency. What that, what that means is how efficient are you at turning photons into electrons? Because remember when I said you might receive 50 photons and so you count 50, but it's not 100%, it's not 100 effective at that. Uh, so every photon isn't counted. If you receive 100 photons and you read out 50, that means your QE is about 50%. And most color cameras are often uh, less than 50% uh, QE on their efficiency on converting uh, photons received into digital counts. Most mono cameras run from the 60 to 80%, even with the color filters. The fact the color filter and we'll talk more about color uh, in a little bit too, but the color filter in front of a mono lets more light through it than the Bayer matrix on a color chip. So you're always going to get better signal uh, with a mono. And that's, that's not opinion, that's objective engineering fact. People get great results from color cameras, don't get me wrong, but if you compare the same chip, uh, color version versus a monochrome version of the exact same sensor, um, you will get better results with a monochrome version um, of that, better signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, another important factor is, do you have an anti-blooming chip? Uh, I'll show you some pictures of what blooming looks like in a minute. Most of the images that we use for pretty pictures are anti-blooming, and that often has a, a that often lowers the QE uh, slightly. Uh, also, uh, back illuminated, uh, back illuminated sensors are very sensitive, usually up in the 95% range. Uh, if you get a back illuminated color camera, you're going to get much better performance than you will uh, from a front illuminated uh, color camera. And that may, that may do a lot for you 
uh, there as well. But QE isn't the whole storage, uh, the whole the whole story. Um, pixel size is also a factor in light gathering capacity. Um, you know, what drives the imaging world isn't astrophotography. And so what, what drives image sensor market is a drive for smaller pixels for higher resolution cameras. And these cameras are used in very bright scenarios compared to what we do in astrophotography. But the truth is small pixels hurt us in astrophotography uh, because it decreases our signal to noise ratio on a, um, on a per pixel basis. Uh, imagine large pixels and small pixels here. Tiny pixels um, you know, aren't gonna pick up a lot of photons before they're gonna get full and start to overflow. Large pixels are gonna collect a lot of photons. So it comes down to how big is your bucket. And small pixels have a very small capacity, very small amount of signal. So you can't gather lots and lots of signal in that one pixel to get your signal to noise ratio where you want it to be. Uh, and the large pixels of course have more uh, capacity basis. This is another reason why uh, gain is important, especially with small sensor uh, uh, chips, a small, I mean, small pixel chips, a small pixel cannot, usually cannot collect 65,000 electrons. And so the gain has to spread that out uh, across that full range for you. And of course, how this affects your image is small pixel cameras tend to be noisier than large pixel cameras. And uh, this is, this has been true for since cameras, since digital cameras became on the market. It, nothing about the CMOS versus CCD world uh, changes this. This is basic. Uh, this is the basic physics. Um, and unless uh, some new great breakthrough that uh, you know comes across, comes along, uh, that's that's the way it's going to be. Another aspect that we need to look at in camera performance is linear response. And what that means is, uh, you know, the more signal, if you get twice as much signal, you want twice as much uh, data in your in your image. Uh, so a nice thing about these blooming chips, if you're doing real science, and I hate the word real science because we get into we get into some needless uh, wars between real science and pretty picture people. Uh, I really I, I I knew some guy early in my imaging days when he said pretty picture people. It was like he was talking about child molesters, and it's like there's nothing wrong with with taking beautiful photographs. Uh, that's that's called qualitative science instead of quantitative science. And uh, usually the people who disagree with that uh, aren't actually scientists, um, but I, I won't get on that soapbox any, either. But a blooming chip uh, has 100% linear, linear response across the whole range. This is, what uh, uh, this is what blooming looks like. Basically the pixels get full and the electrons spill out in the channel and you get these big streaks. The nice thing about blooming uh, sensors is they're more sensitive than anti-blooming. Now, of course, this kind of counts against you if you're doing pretty picture stuff or documentary stuff because you have to get rid of these in post-processing. So most people are willing to give up a little bit of quantum efficiency uh, in return for getting rid of these spikes. You have to have a little extra circuitry on the chip that drains off the surplus uh, surplus electrons. Let's go back to this picture. You know, if you can imagine this bucket filling up and just overflowing, the water's gonna spill out all over the floor it has to go somewhere. Uh, electrons are real physical things. They got to go somewhere. And what they do is they go into the neighboring pixels in the, uh, in the chip array. Okay, so let's talk about um, CMOS versus CCD a little bit because that is a hot topic. Uh, this is a CMOS and a CCD sensor next to each other. And as you can see, um, there's not a real big difference uh, between them when, you, when you're just looking at them. And really, the truth is they both really do work more or less the same way. There are some subtle differences that affect uh, our, uh, our performance at a, at a quantitative uh, level. Images are basically numbers. So when you get a nice picture uh, from your astronomical camera, uh, all of these pixels are just numbers. Uh, usually they're not between 0 and 255 until you convert them down to a, a JPEG. They'll be between 0 and 65,000. Uh, but, you know, the dark pixels are small numbers and the bright pixels are large numbers. And all that image sensor does is collect photons and count them. 
And uh, both the CMOS and the CCD are doing the same thing. They have pixels that count, that count photons. And they both have quantum efficiency, so they don't count all of the photons that arrive. And they both have read noise, and they both have other sorts of noise uh, that affect them. Uh, and at the, in the end, you want a nice picture, and that's, it's pretty much the same thing. Now, unless you've lived in a cave, you realize that um, CMOS has taken over, so to speak. And so I want to say a few words about why that's, uh, why that's happening. Uh, most of the CCD sensors that we use in our cameras are made by either Sony or OnSimi, uh, which was way, way back after a couple of, um, a, a couple of generations uh, was, uh, was Kodak. Sony's announced they're phasing out CCD production within the next five years. And OnSimi uh, is ceasing uh, CCD production this year. The OnSimi announcement really surprised uh, a lot of people. Uh, my, uh, my people in the industry tell me that the primary reason for that is they actually can't repair the machines. CCD technology uh, is, um, is, a, is, a dying, is a dying breed. And so the machines to make CCDs, uh, they're not making them as much. And um, it's very, very expensive uh, to, to keep doing that. And so that's one of the reasons they stopped doing CCD uh, protection. There are other options, there are other manufacturers besides Sony and Onsumi that make CCDs, and who knows, maybe they'll rise to the occasion and flood the astronomical market with uh, cheap and affordable CCD uh, sensors. Um, it's not going to happen, though, I, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Why is CMOS taking over? Well, for one thing, they are cheaper to manufacture. So advances in manufacturing technology um, and the way CC, C, CMOS is made, uh, it's much, it takes much less money to make a CMOS sensor than it does to take a CCD sensor. Uh, also, because of the high level of integration, uh, the chips are smaller and require less circuitry around them. Uh, so they're cheaper and they're smaller, take up less space, and they can re you can read them out faster. There are some very fast CCD sensors, uh, but they're extremely expensive. Uh, whereas CMOS is just inherently much, much faster. Uh, throw in there that they require less, less, less power. So, okay, let me see if I get this straight. They're cheaper, smaller, they do more, faster, and they, and they pull less power. So there's no surprise that everybody is switching to CMOS uh, because of these market factors. And what always happens when you're with a group of astronomers or you're at, a, at an astronomy club or star party, and people don't like to be told this, but I'm just going to be very blunt with you. Uh, you live in a bubble, uh, and the things you're interested in you think are really important to the rest of the world. And unfortunately, they're not, um, because astronomy is really a very, very small gnat uh, on the back of an enormous cash cow, which is the, the imaging uh, market. Uh, security cameras alone dwarf astronomy by orders of magnitude. Uh, every time you stop at a red light, there's probably five or six cameras looking at your car and taking pictures of them. Uh, industrial vision and manufacturing is also uh, very huge. You know, in fact, most, most of the cameras that you buy for astronomy, the, the vendors who make them actually make cameras for other markets and they were just sort of interested in doing astronomy, uh, you know, along the way. Um, but, you know, manufacturing, you, you can have a, a thing on a belt that counts things as they go by and it has to press a lever and it's mechanical and it breaks down. Or you can have a camera focused on the belt and the computer software can count things as they go by. And one of those is much cheaper and much more reliable and needs much less maintenance. And so you can imagine uh, where that's going to go. The really high-end astronomy camera vendors are, uh, make most of their money in the life sciences, putting cameras on microscopes. Uh, in fact, you do yourself a, a favor if you want to know about camera performance and image calibration. Uh, Google around in some life, life sciences websites. Uh, they have the same exact issues that we do in astronomy. They're taking darks and biases and flats to calibrate uh, their data and so forth. And of course, then there's just commercial photography, uh, people taking pictures. There are more wedding photographers, again, wedding photography alone, by orders of magnitude, more than people who are doing astronomical uh, photography. A modern automobile, I did not believe this when I read it. Um, 
a modern brand new car has probably 20 or more image sensors in it looking at stuff like what what could it possibly be looking at uh but they'll they do a lot of things uh optically with with the, with those things and so you know by itself we've already dwarfed the astronomy market to virtual insignificance in the eyes of these corporations that are making uh these sensors and that are investing billions and billions of dollars into plants to make these sensors uh, and then you know to throw in you know the icing on the cake is the cell phone industry because cell phones dwarf everything else. Uh, the cell phone uh, in 2020, according to a market report I looked at, uh, they expect to sell 6 billion cell phones. Good, good Lord. There, there's, it, there's not much more than 6 billion people in the world. Right. I mean, that's like, that's a lot of cell phones and that market is worth $345 billion. Um, you know, in comparison, there is there is nobody. By the way, I'm going to do the other vendors a favor. I'm going to tell all you customers now: if you think anybody in the astronomy business is getting rich, you are sadly, sadly, sadly mistaken. Everybody I know that is in the astronomy business is doing it because they're nut. There's nuts about astronomy as you are, because. Um, any of us could make way more money in other industries than what the astronomy uh, industry uh, you know, can support. So uh, that's why CMOS is taking over the world. And uh, as they say, it flows downhill and that's affecting the astronomy community. And, uh, you know, so, you know, there's not going to be, you know, in five years, we still got a pretty good, uh, we st we're still got a pretty good supply of CCDs coming from Sony for the next they're still making them for at least the next five years. And then there'll be, you know, stockpiles uh, after that. So uh, at least the Sony CCDs, which are quite good, uh, honestly, are still going to be around uh, for, for quite a while. Now the whole CMOS versus CCD, how does that affect us when we do a camera uh, choice? You know, CCD, CMOS is catching up with CCD. I've heard this for 20 years, that CMOS is catching up with CCD. Uh, and they're right, it is catching up, but, and in some areas it's caught up and in some areas it's very close, but it is very, it is getting very big in the rear view mirror. Uh, all right. So in some areas, CMOS has already caught CCDs. All right. When it comes to say quantum efficiency, how efficient are you at collecting photons and turning them into electrical signal that we can read out? Uh, when I started imaging, CMOS was way behind C, uh, CCD. And then maybe only five years ago, my slides would say, you know, if you're doing UV or far infrared, CCD still has an advantage. But by and large, that advantage has disappeared. And CMOS and CCD are, are pretty much on equal ground. These are general box with, I have this and this CMOS, and it's better than that, and that's CCD. Because my response is going to be, well, duh. All right, we've been making CCDs and CMOS for over, you know, 30 years. There are going to be some CMOS that are better than some CCD, and there's going to be some back and forth. So I'm talking about, in general, the latest crop uh, of sensors. Uh, CMOS and CCD are on, uh, you know, pretty much an equal footing, and I would say that CMOS is caught up. Uh, another problem is read noise. Read noise, read noise on CMOS used to be really horrible in comparison to CCD. And over time, and actually truth be told, CCD read noises used to be really bad as well. Only 10 years ago, uh, the read noise on a typical astro camera was at least twice what it is today. Uh, but read noise is caught up with, uh, with CCD. Now, a lot of people are, think CMOS is past CCD on read noise and without getting on my soapbox or going into a lot of math, those are games we play with, with gain. Um, the, the objective tr engineering truth is that um, the readout, uh, readout noise is pretty much equivalent. Uh, they've caught up. So you're getting really good read noise performance with a new Sony CCD with, you know, modern electronics, and you're getting the same. You're, get, you're also getting really good performance from the CMOS. So I'm not saying CMOS isn't caught up or isn't as good. What I'm saying is truth is they're both about equivalent, which is still a really good thing because it means that CMOS is, is, is doing very well in this arena, and it's not really something you should be uh, worried about. Uh, on readout speed, this is like the first thing that CMOS really lapped CCD on, uh, on readout, readout speed. 
Um, just the readout speed on CMOS is phenomenal, which uh, is really great for, for uh, lucky imaging applications and download speed. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that some more in a minute. CMOS is still catching up, though. Uh, a few things where it's still catching up, uh, full well capacity and bit depth, uh, basically large pixels. Um, uh, it's, it's easier to find a larger pixel CCD camera than it is to find a larger pixel uh, CMOS camera. Now that is changing. Um, I would say CMOS is still catching up, but it's nipping at the back bumper. Uh, like the new uh, 455 chip from Sony has a full 16-bit readout and has a full wall capacity of about 50,000. And that's 50,000 is a really good full wall capacity for a CMOS sensor. It's not as good as my 100,000, you know, full wall capacity on one of my CCDs, but it's pretty competitive. At a certain point, we get to where uh, you're paying a lot of extra money for only maybe 10% more, uh, more performance. And I would say... Um, Maybe a year from now, even I might not be saying uh, that uh, CMOS is still catching up in this area. Another area we're seeing rapid improvement on with some of the newer chips is amp low and also pattern noise. And these are artifacts in your image that can't be easily carried out like they can in a CCD image. And those, again, I'm, I'm fully. I'm fully acknowledging those are getting much smaller. Some of the new stuff uh, has shown some really dramatic improvement on amp noise uh, and pattern noise. Uh, the other thing is uh, linearity, where C this, there's also some interesting work being done to get CMOS sensors to be uh, more linear. Let me go into a little more detail about some of these things. Uh, I don't know if this is coming through well on the Zoom, but this is a video of the moon. Um, through a high magnification telescope. This is, we call this lucky imaging. And what you do is you can't take a nice long exposure of that and it be nice and clear because it's bumping all around. So we take a video um, and there's really, there's really not any such thing as a video camera anymore. It's just cameras are very fast frame rates. So we collect a hundred thousand, well not a hundred thousand, save, you know, five, 10,000 frames of video and then we'll use software like Registax or Astro Stacker uh, to go through there and find the really crisp frames for us to isolate them. And then we combine all of the really sharp frames together and we do our processing on it. And we can make a very high resolution image of the moon or the planets or the sun. This is much better than we could do with deep sky objects. And the reason this works is because the sun and the moon and the planets are so much more brighter than even say the Andromeda galaxy. So you can't take a whole bunch of 1 60th of a second images of the Andromeda galaxy. The read noise of the camera is gonna swamp the signal, but on a bright target, you can do that and you can stack those images. And in this area, CMOS has been the undisputed king for a long time. Uh, I've done this like a lot of you've probably done this with CCD uh, webcams back in the day. But honestly, this, as soon as the CMOS became available, uh, it really was a, it was a very strong advantage uh, to doing that. Uh, another, another area where CMOS is still catching up that is somewhat important is on the full well uh, or the bit depth of your, uh, of your pixels. And this is a hard thing for most people to wrap their heads around if they're, if they're not computer science uh, geeks. So I've come up with an analogy, which is imagine that if all you have are $100 bills, Sounds great, right? But nobody makes change. And if you go to a nice restaurant and you bring your friend and uh, you enjoy a really nice meal in an expensive restaurant and it's $100, all right, there you go. You got your money's worth. But now imagine you're, uh, you're at a concert or something and you go to a vending machine and you want a soft drink. Well, that's $100 too because there's no smaller denomination. So your soft drink's $100, your nice fancy meal is $100, and you're not really... Uh, it's very wasteful, all right? You're, you're losing a lot of money. Now imagine that you have a pile of hundred of $1 bills instead. Your nice expensive meal may still cost you um, $100, but it's going to be, uh, you know, it's $100. But when you stop to get your soda at the, at the vending machine, it may only be $2 or, well, today, $3 to get it. And now you've You've, you've still got some money left over. So this is, this is a good thing. Well, when you're reading out your data, uh, the, the same sort of thing happens based on the bit depth of your camera. 
And I'm going to cheat and move ahead. I was working on these slides earlier today, and I put this slide in the wrong place. Um, but And I got into a debate. Somebody wanted to debate me on the Sky and Tell uh, forum when I was talking about 8-bit cameras. Uh, I don't like 8-bit cameras. Like It's fine because you're going to stack them, and you can recover all that data. No, you can't. The data coming off the camera is inherently bend into these small containers. All you got is a $100 bill. And so for an example, let's say, now that we've talked about ADUs, let's say you're reading pixels and you're getting numbers like five and 10, and these are noise. So these are random fluctuations. And, but you're also getting some signals. Sometimes you get 27, sometimes you get 24. But because your camera is only a uh, low pick, actually an eight bit camera, it's gonna be 256, not 32 here if you do the math. But it's a good example. Uh, no matter what number you get, the number you're going to read out is 32. So you've got noise down here, and you've got signal up here, and it all gets clumped into 32. So if you, you can average all of the 32s you want, the number is still going to be 32. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that software engineers are like, well, duh. But if you're not, it's, it, it may seem a little, a little mystical to you. And you're like, well, I'm going to take that 8-bit data, and I'm going to convert it into 32-bit data, and then I'm going to stack that 32-bit data. It doesn't matter. 32 is an 8-bit data. 32 is a 64-bit data. 32-bit is a 256-bit data type. No matter how many times you average 32, the answer is going to be 32, because that's what came out of the camera. So going back to this slide then, all right? Uh, pattern noise. Um, actually, no, this is not pattern noise. This is amp glow. So this is amp glow, if you can see my mouse, down here in the lower right-hand corner. And CMOS has been plagued by amp glow for years. The truth is, um, if you're new to the game, you may not remember that CCDs also had a lot of amp glow. Uh, in fact, uh, the amplifier for CCDs is off of the chip, off to the side. And you would get something that looks like this from the amplifier sitting next to the CCD chip. CMOS does not have the amplifier off to the side. In fact, CMOS has the amplifier. Each pixel has its own amplifier. And so it's not truly amp glow, uh, but it looks like what amp glow used to be. And so we call it amp glow. But that's a that's an $800 question on Jeopardy, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're splitting hairs there. It's still glow from electronics that are around. Uh, the CMOS chip. And if you uh, if you buy a low-cost CMOS camera, you're probably going to get a lot of amp glow or that glow around it. This is hard as Dickens to calibrate out. Uh, you can subtracting uh, subtracting darks uh, will 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 sort of help a little bit, uh, but you're, you're giving up a lot of your dynamic range in your image. It it basically adds noise to that part of your image no matter what you do. And so this is something we really don't want to put up with unless you absolutely have to. Now that said, remember I said CMOS is catching up. Uh, the latest, greatest crop of CMOS sensors and electronics design, and I actually think it has more to do with the camera vendor's experience making CMOS cameras than, than it does with the chip itself. But that's speculation from a software guy. Hardware guy is gonna go, no, and that's fine. I'll, I'll listen to you if you're a hardware engineer. Um, but the, the fact remains that it, Lately, uh, we're starting to see some cameras with very low amp glow. Now, these cameras are not cheap. Anybody who thinks they're going to buy a $300 CMOS camera and it's going to outperform a $5,000 CCD camera uh, that's currently on the market um, is, is fooling themselves. But, you know, dollar for dollar, if you buy a, a really, you know, high-cost CMOS camera that's well-engineered and has quality components, uh, it's going to be very competitive with a equally well-engineered, equally quality a CCD camera, and the amp glow looks like it is not completely gone yet, uh, but it is uh, it is very, very much uh, mitigated. Um, I know a scientist who's doing work with very, very faint objects uh, that told me that there's still not a CMOS camera on the market that he can use uh, for his research, but I'm not sure in five years I'll ask him again, and I don't know that that'll be true anymore. It may not be true a year from now, uh, but at least today uh, that that is the case. So now we'll jump past my other slides, talk about pattern noise. This is another bugaboo with many, but not all CMOS cameras, is this dancing uh, pattern noise. 
So this is two images next to each other. And again, I don't know if it comes across with enough resolution on your on Zoom, but you can see these lines on the left-hand side don't line up with these lines on the right-hand side. And you generally don't get that with a CCD camera. You do get that with a lot of CMOS cameras and that doesn't calibrate out. You can't just take dark and, and subtract that. And so you'll get that pattern <coughs> in all of your raw images. Now, the way to mitigate that is just take lots and lots of images and stack with a statistical objection, and that'll help, that'll help clean it up uh, quite a bit. But it's a compromise uh, like, like many other. And you, know, you don't see this with high-end. If you get a nice DSLR, that's a CMOS, and you don't see this sort of thing uh, very much anymore. And with some of the better uh, CMOS cameras, you don't see this uh, very much anymore. But honestly, if your budget is you know, only $900 for a camera. These are the sorts of things that you're, uh, that you may have to contend with. Uh, on linearity, I wanted to show you some examples, uh, real world examples, measurements. Uh, I borrowed this from, uh, I didn't borrow this. I'll, I'll hang on a minute, I'll tell you. But a linear response means basically it's a straight line. And if you get twice as much signal, you get twice as much, um, you get twice as big a number in your in your image. Film didn't do this. You could expose for a long time in film, and then it would stop becoming uh, sensitive. They called that uh, reciprocity failure. And so when we started imaging with digital chips, they were much better than film, almost right off the bat. Uh, here's an example of nonlinear. These are made-up curves right here. And this just shows that, that this is not straight. Down here, you get lots of signal, but you don't get a lot of you don't get a lot of uh, data on the sensor. Uh, or you might see something like this, where it's linear through part of the range, but it's not linear up here at the top, and it's not linear down here at the bottom. And as long as you expose in here, you'll get a nice linear response from your from your sensor. Now this I stole from Rose. Uh, Rose Smith our, uh, at Software Best. She's our uh, astrophysicist and systems engineer. She has the coolest title uh, at the whole company. But she was... Um, you know, basically measuring the response for a particular camera for a project. And this is a real camera. I'm not going to tell you which one it was. I, I remember the brand, but I'm not going to tell you that either. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. But this is, a real, this is a real plot of image data based on the amount of signal. And you can see right here, you get, you get this nice boost. But right here, you're exposing longer and longer, or you get more and more light, and you just don't get any new values. The, the, the CMOS, it's like the, it's dead and it's not listening. It's not really what's happening. It usually has to do with the electronics and how things are digitized. But what happens is you can expose a little bit longer and you're not getting any extra data. So if you're imaging a really faint object, you're going to be exposing for longer periods of time and not actually getting any new data with this sort of a nonlinear response. Now, fortunately, most, again, most CC, uh, most of your uh, CMOS cameras aren't quite this bad down at the lower range. But this is an example of the sort of things that you can indeed see uh, with a nonlinear response. Why do I care about nonlinearity? Uh, there are two really uh, good examples. If you're doing photometry, so you're trying to do variable star studies or you discovered a supernova, this is like my very first supernova image, uh, real, you know, APOG quality here. But there is a supernova in the middle of that galaxy, and there is a dot there. And if you dark subtract this uh, to get the, uh, the base current out of it, you can compare the brightness of this supernova to the brightness of these bright stars, and you can very easily calculate how bright that supernova is. And that's a very important piece of quantitative scientific data. Qualitative scientific data is there is a supernova in here. So if you take a pretty picture of a galaxy with the supernova and they say that's useless for scientific purposes, that person is basically blowing smoke. Up. Uh, it's perfectly valid scientifically. It's just qualitatively scientific because I know that galaxy has a supernova going on. I can't tell you how bright it is because my camera was nonlinear. Uh, but I can tell you that there was a supernova, or I applied a nonlinear stretch, and now you know I've destroyed the ability to determine that. But it is valuable scientific information, uh, nonetheless, because I can call my friend and say, "Hey, there's a bright blob in the middle of this galaxy. You need to get on it." Uh, I was using my $30 uh, Chinese camera, and there's a bright blob there. You need to get on it with something better so that we can measure the brightness. And then the two of you made a supernova discovery, and life is awesome. Another area where 
uh, linearity of your chip is important is when you take flats. Uh, it's notoriously difficult to get flats to work with mini CMOS cameras because of the nonlinearity uh, of their response. And flats don't just get rid of vignetting, they also get rid of all this crap. Uh, dust bunnies, these little donuts are, are caused from uh, little flecks of dust that are uh, on your sensor and they create a shadow. Uh, and you want to get rid of them. You need to calibrate them out uh, with flat fields. Really, when it comes to CMOS versus CCD, the, the way I look at it is it's kind of steak versus hamburger at this point in time. Um, steak is generally considered to be very good and better than a hamburger, right? Um, but there are lots of exceptions. Uh, who hasn't had an amazing hamburger? And who hasn't had a really lousy steak? Uh, in fact, most of the time when I eat out, it's a lousy steak, uh, except for very few uh, places that I think have, have good steak. Uh, but, you know, steak is steak and hamburgers, hamburger. You can get a hamburger for a buck, you know, somewhere and it, you know, it's something. Uh, but there are some really nice hamburgers uh, that are really awesome. And which one you choose is going to, you know, how hungry are you? Uh, how much money do you have? Uh, what's available to you where you are and how long are you willing to wait for your food to be prepared? And so it's the same sort of thing with a CMOS or CCD camera. And five years from now, I won't be able to show this slide at all uh, for sure, because you're going to have steak next to steak. And we're going to be arguing about whether, you know, uh, you know, sirloin is, is better than a ribeye uh, because they're going to be very, uh, they're going to be very close. So there, I've not told you to go by that you should buy a CCD, and I've not told you that you shouldn't buy a CMOS. Uh, they both have their, their merits, and um, and you shouldn't feel, yeah. So what about some trade-offs for color versus mono? Uh, color is darn convenient. Uh, color camera is just, it's just really ideal for some situations uh, that I, I've got some examples. Uh, it's just very convenient to get one picture. If I can only get one photo and I want a color photo, then I'm going to use a color, I'm going to use a color camera. Uh, it is less sensitive, uh, bang for buck, uh, uh, that, you know, if you, um, if you have the same chip. So I did some experiments even to prove this once, 694 color, 694 mono. I mean, we know that you don't have to, you, you don't really have to do much of experiment. You know, less light is, is arriving on the color sensor than arrives on the mono. And we know the basic physics of signal to noise ratio does not get made, mitigated by clever interpolation routines. You're getting better signal to noise ratio. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's a, that's, you shouldn't make your decision based on that. If you have a very fast optic, it's going to deliver a lot of light to that. You know, if you've got a Rasa, and you're shooting at f2, um, you're getting tons and tons of light. And so, yeah, it's not quite as good as a mono, but who cares? In 10 minutes, you still have all the data you need, even with a color chip. Uh, and, and so, you know, life, life is still good. Or if you're shooting bright objects, if you're shooting the moon, um, the moon is a really bright target. Uh, does it really matter? Uh, I like to shoot the moon in mono just because I like to put an IR filter or something in front of it. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're shooting color photos of the moon, there's no point using uh, a monochrome camera with, with filters. There's no doubt mono is more work. And this is really the trade-off. Uh, you're going to do more work in post-processing with a mono camera and a filter wheel, uh, but you will have better data to, to work with. So what's more important to you? Um, you know, you may live somewhere where you just don't have a lot of time. And are you willing to put that in after the fact? There are more versatile, though. Uh, as well as being, uh, you know, more sensitive. So they're, let's back up. Uh, they're more sensitive. So slower optical systems, like if you've got a Schmidt Cassegrain or some long focal length F10 uh, or, you know, a, a, Ca a Mac Cassegrain or something, F15 or something, uh, mono is going to be much better results than uh, a color camera. I would never shoot a color camera at F10 even. I would say F for me, F7 is sort of the, the line there. You get at least F7 or better before I would fool with a color camera. Otherwise, you just have to take way too much more data uh, with that color chip to catch up. Uh, if you're shooting at F2 or F3, uh, one of my favorite uh, telescopes is an F3. At F3, it doesn't matter. I can shoot a few extra minutes at color and I got all the data, uh, all the data I need. 
how do color chips really work? So I, like I said, uh, inherently speaking, color chips don't get as much light onto the sensor as a mono. And this is why uh, it's actually a mono sensor underneath and it's got this little array of, um, of filters. Now there's a couple of other new designs. None of them have really caught on. So I'm aware of uh, that there's actually an LRGB version of this. And then there's one where there's different layers and the wavelengths penetrate into the silicon a little more. And that's found its way into some some security cameras and some DSLRs, but they're not uh, they're not really um, they're not really mainstream yet. So I'm going to intentionally ignore those for the time being. Um, but the mono cameras, uh, these filter on the chip blocks more of the light than the filter from a monochrome chip does. Uh, so you're losing you're inherently losing a little bit of your quantum efficiency uh, right there, and, and that's the main drawback. Uh, to color. A raw color ch uh, image kind of looks like this. You get this checkerboard pattern. Uh, the dark blue, the darker, darker pixels are usually the blue channel and then the brighter pixels are the red and the green. And you take this checkerboard pattern and you convert it into a color image. Uh, and the process is called debayer or demosaic or colorized. Depends on whose post-processing uh, program you're using. I think I started with Nebulosity many years ago and they called it demosaic. Uh, most programs call it uh, debayer now. Another alternative is super pixel, where you don't do any interpolation at all. You just use the red, green, blue channels, and it makes an image half the resolution, but uh, it's only using the actual measure data instead of uh, interpolation. Uh, there are different uh, different algorithms for converting debayer into color. Uh, I've been having a lot of discussions with a customer and, a, and a, another camera company about this. Uh, how do I debayer my images? And there's a lot of confusion that the debayer pattern is somehow altering uh, their data if you when you try to display it in color. The raw, raw data looks like this. It looks like this checkerboard pattern. The debayer pattern is nothing but a hint to tell me how to turn that into color data. So if you debayer in VNG, the underlying data is exactly the same. Now, when you bring a camera, uh, an image from like a, a DSLR into Photoshop or something, it automatically, even when the raw, even camera raw, doesn't show you what this data looks like. You have to be a programmer and actually read the bits out of the raw file uh, to get uh, to get the data that looks like this. The nice thing, um, well, you know, the approach to getting color data with a monochrome camera is this: we'll take images with a red filter, which only gives me red light and images with a green filter and a blue filter, and then we convert that into uh, RGB. There's also luminance imaging where you'll take a high resolution. Luminance, you get way more signal than RG or B alone. And so if you have really good conditions, you can take luminance and get lots of really good data very quickly. Um, and then you can combine that with lower quality RGB data. Uh, it used to bend the RGB to get more signal to noise. It's not really necessary with newer cameras anymore, but you could shoot the RGB data from one location where the conditions aren't as good and, art and luminance data somewhere where the conditions are better, and you could combine that. So you just take your, your color data and you combine it with the luminance and you get a much nicer, uh, higher, uh, you know, better contrast image from that. Binning is a is another buzzword. Uh, what that does is it sums neighboring pixels at readout. So, you know, typically it's two by two or three by three. Uh, some cameras like QSI will have, you can do five by one binning. Uh, that's useful if you're doing spectroscopy. Uh, but most of us doing deep sky astrophotography, we just want two by two or three by three binning. It sort of brightens the image uh, and it speeds up the download because the image is going to be smaller. Uh, the real benefit to binning is it reduces the read noise off the chip. So when you bin a faint target to see what it's going to look like with a short exposure, you're getting some brightness benefit with the short exposure, but really you could do that artificially with the stretch. The real benefit is the read noise has gone down. And if you have very, very little signal, getting that very, very small amount of signal above the read noise allows you to see the image uh, very clearly. Now here's the thing. Uh, okay. All right, I did have more to say about that. We're getting kind of close, so I don't want to talk too much about this. I don't like the bend except when my seeing is poor or if I'm oversampled. And here's an example. You really can't tell which one of these was bend. If your signal is high 
and condition and you're getting round stars you're you're giving up a lot of spatial resolution by uh, by binning uh, unless your signal is down in the read noise by the way CMOS cameras cannot actually bend and you're like no that's not true I got two by two and four by four binning yeah but they're being binned in firmware they're not being binned on the sensor and because of that you don't get the read noise advantage from binning uh, you do get a smaller image, and if it's done in the firmware on the camera, you might get a faster download, um, but the, you are not getting the read noise advantage from binning on a CMOS that you would on a CCD. Most cameras have such low read noise now that, you know, five years ago, I might have went, you know, that's a pretty big deal. Read noise, uh, you know, it's way better than using a CMOS. Now, both CMOS and C CCD both have such low read noise that there's not quite as much uh, bang for the buck there. Um, but it is, it is a factor that may, that may affect you. Another reason to do monochrome over um, color is so you can do narrowband filtering. And what that is, is you have filters that only let through a specific wavelength of light. So hydrogen alpha, as you can guess, is emitted by hydrogen atoms, uh, sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen beta. These are also, I uh, use nitrogen. A lot of uh, planetary nebula have uh, a lot strong nitrogen emissions. Um, hydrogen beta, I don't have as much use for. Uh, that's narrower, it's more of a blue color. Uh, and I find I can synthesize that for my hydrogen alpha data because there's always about 20% hydrogen beta whenever you get hydrogen alpha. Nice thing about narrowband, most of these wavelengths are resistant to light pollution and the moon. So now you're just limited by the weather, which doesn't matter. The weather is always going to be terrible uh, no matter where you look. And this, this is not really useful for galaxies. It can sort of bring out the star forming regions in, in galaxies that are close by where they're large. Uh, for tiny galaxies and clusters, you don't get much benefit from doing an HA exposure uh, on a galaxy. And certainly I've yet to see anything interesting from O3 or sulfur uh, on a galaxy but they're great for emission targets. And the Milky Way is full of emission nebula, uh, putting out light at these wavelengths. And you can do, uh, you can do sort of pseudo real color, or you can do false color uh, images that look uh, really nice from this. So, wow, I'm on slide 50 of 82. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drag this out too much longer. I'm just gonna kind of go through some of this very quickly some things you need to be aware of. And then that way we still have some time for questions. And you can always email uh, Kevin. I've got his cell phone number too, his personal cell phone number. Let me give you that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Um, a few things about DSLRs. DSLRs were designed to take these types of pictures, but they also work really great for these kinds of pictures. And they also work really great for these kinds of pictures. And they also work really great for these kinds of pictures and these kinds of pictures and these kinds of pictures and these kinds of pictures. And these kinds of pictures and these kinds of pictures. So basically, stop coming up to me at a star party and apologizing, well, I'm only using a DSLR. A DSLR is the most versatile camera you can own. If you if I could only have one camera, it would be it would be my DSLR. If I had to give up all my 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 cameras, my CC, my real expensive, nice CCD cameras, which don't actually belong to me anyway, but let's say they showed up and they said, sorry, Richard, you gotta give it all back because um, you're fired. Um, I'd keep my DSLR camera. That would be like my number one camera because it is the most versatile camera uh, that I that I have. I, I really like, I'm doing a little plug here for Canon, the EOS RA is a really great DSLR for uh, astrophotography as well. Uh, when you have a DSLR, if, if it's not modified, uh, you can have it modified so it's more sensitive to those emission wavelengths. Uh, birds at ponds usually don't radiate hydrogen alpha uh, light. And so uh, the cameras filter out infrared and they also happen to catch all of the uh, HA uh, light as well. But you can have your camera modified and you replace the filter inside it. Now the birds across the lake are going to look like this. And this is actual photo I took with um, a modified camera. The, the nice picture of the bird I corrected in post with a custom white balance. Uh, but the reddish image is sort of what it looked like. Uh, coming out of the camera and it, it makes a big difference. Uh, this I also I actually took with my camera before I sent it off to be modified. This is about 15 years ago. This is an old, old Canon T1i maybe. Um, and I, I shot the, the 
California Nebula, the real short exposure, sent it off to, to somebody and they, they modified it and sent it back and I took the same same picture with the same uh, camera and optic. And you can see you get quite a bit more signal. And that signal, yeah, you can stretch this image and get that red out. But remember, more signal means better signal to noise ratio. So you are getting better data. It's not just that you can stretch that red and make it look red. You are actually getting smoother red when you do it this way because you're getting more signal registered onto the image sensor. Uh, really, when it comes to DSLR versus CCD, you know, there's a few things to take into account. Uh, let's see. Uh, DSLRs cost, cost a lot more. They're, li they're much dueler purpose, so it's, it's easier to convince your spouse or significant other that uh, we can use this for the zoo and beach trips as well as for my uh, nightscapes. Uh, a lot of DSL, a lot of CCD cameras, if they have a shutter, uh, they can't take real high frame rate images either. So if you want to take real short exposures uh, of bright targets, uh, like the moon, it's actually really hard to shoot the moon if you've got a big 16803 on the back of a giant uh, telescope. Another thing that really significantly improves the performance of your camera is to cool it. I shot this with my uh, F3 uh, Veloce. One night I, I took a photo with my, it was one of my DSLRs. Yeah, there it is. It's, it's been quite a while since I did this. 5D Mark II, it's been modified. So this is the HA data. Uh, uh, I took only the red pixels, so none of the green or blue pixels were contributing noise, uh, because that's all you get with HA on a, if you're doing a HA filter in front of a modified camera, the blue and green pixels are worthless. Um, and then I shot it with a cooled Starlight Express camera. And the benefit, the difference here, it, you know, the, the QE was a little better on the Starlight Express and the read noise, you know, about the same, but the real big win here is that the camera was cooled and I got much less thermal noise because the heat in your camera generates, um, you know, uh, electrons as well. And so you get signal that isn't actually there. And that's the, the signal from the thermal, uh, from the thermal currents in your chip. Uh, people go to great ex uh, lengths to cool their DSLRs, build these little cooling boxes. I find honestly in Florida, uh, I may as well not put a, a DSLR on the back of a telescope in the summertime. The summertime temperatures are in the 90s at night, and um, there's no point. Uh, the camera warms up, the chip's at 40 or 45 degrees Celsius, and uh, the images are just too noisy. In the wintertime, they're great. Uh, but you can also, let's see, da, da, da. All right, so yeah, so cooling your chip makes them better. Uh, you can buy a cooled one-shot color camera. Uh, this goes for CCD or CMOS as well, and uh, that's great. The last thing I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to go into pixel size and sampling. We'll leave that for another another talk. You know, consider the, the chip size or the, the frame size. Here's um, some field of view indicators I set with the sky. This is the same telescope with different cameras, and a bigger chip is going to give you a bigger part of the sky. I have actually have all the Skywatcher Esprits. I don't know how many people can uh, make that boast. Uh, but I can set the 80 millimeter Esprit, which has a focal length of 400, and I can set up the 150 millimeter Esprit, which has a focal length of 1050, next to each other. And uh, you know, the long focal length is going to give you a much, you know, much more magnification, right? Well, I can, based on the camera, I can get exactly the same field of view. I can put a very large sensor on the Esprit 80 and a very small sensor on the Esprit 150, and they both have identical fields of view. Um, of course, the Esprit 50 is faster. It's like F5, so uh, that'll, uh, that'll be better than the F7. But the, the point is, uh, take into account your, uh, you know, your field of view that you want. Uh, you know, get some software. If it's not the sky, use Stellarium or something to see. You know, if I get this camera and this telescope, what what's going to fit in my field of view? I want to be able to get the horse head, or I want to be able to shoot galaxies, and so I need it to be. Uh, a little smaller. Don't buy a camera from anybody. The first question they ask you should be, well, what kind of telescope do you have? The second question they should ask you is, well, what do you want to take pictures of? Maybe in reverse order. Uh, but an important factor to consider is pixel scale. And I'm going to rush through this because this is the sort of thing that's readily visible, readily available uh, uh, on the, you know, you can Google this and find out how to calculate your image scale. The important thing here is you don't want to uh, undersample uh, your image. If your pixels are too big for your seeing conditions, uh, stars are going to be like little 
uh, squares, and uh, basically how many pixels do you need for, for a star to appear round. And a lot of people use Nyquist um, uh, as, a, as a thing, and Nyquist says it needs to be two times or greater sampled to be critically sampled. I actually learned about Nyquist in a college class and not uh, Cloudy Nights. And so I'm going to tell you that uh, signals that are sinusoidal in nature are actually supposed to be at least three times signaled, uh, sampled. Uh, so in order to make, in a, in, you know, layman's terms, how many squares does it take to make a star look round? One pixel is not enough. Two is not enough either, but three by three is enough to make something start to look like it's round. Now, bear in mind, too, that you can't beat the seeing. If you're at the bottom and next to a mountain range and the air is rushing over that mountain range, your seeing is going to be terrible. Or if you're in a hot parking lot and you're shooting over hot buildings, your seeing is going to be terrible. The air is going to be bouncing around. And, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to sample uh, very, uh, very great. So, all right. So, blah, blah, blah. I think I have some, yeah, some basic pointers here. Small pixels work really great with fast optics. Large pixels work really great with slow or long focal lengths. So if you want to shoot at that native 3950 on your C14, you need to have some big pixels on that camera. Don't put your, you know, 4.6 or 2.7 micron camera on there, unless unless you're doing lucky imaging. Because in lucky imaging, you're taking thousands of photos very fast, and for a moment or two, the seeing is going to be very stable, and you're going to get some frame where uh, you get usable data. But for deep sky stuff, whatever you're shooting is not going to hold still uh, long enough for you to get a, a good image. So you want some nice big pixels uh, to collect that light. And mono with filters will always beat one shot color. You know, uh, as long as you're comparing apples to apples, the same sensor that let me repeat that again, because I somebody always has got a chip on their shoulder about this. My CMOS is better than your CCD. It probably is. I'm going to tell you right now. You don't need to tell me that because I believe you already. Um, but if you have the same chip, two of the same chip and one mono and one's color, the mono version of that chip will give you better signal to noise ratio than the color version of that chip You are if you, if you want to shoot. Now, are you willing to make that trade off? If you're shooting with a Rasa, who cares? Uh, I'm getting so much data. I'm going to get plenty of data in a very short amount of time. But if you are trying to shoot at F10, and uh, you've got plenty of clear nights and you want to go really deep on an object and you want to get the very best results, you will get better um, you will get better results with a monochrome camera. Now for the geek heads uh, in the audience, and I mean that I mean that term very affectionately, uh, if you are technically minded, uh, there's a really good book that will teach you everything you need to know about actual camera performance. It's called Photon Transfer, which is about transforming photons into signal. It's written by James Janicek, who is the father of, uh, the real father of CCD uh, imaging and CCD um, uh, CCD sensors. And uh, they'll teach you all kinds of things about how to uh, recharacterize your camera and, and measure things like read noise and dark current and that sort of thing. And now only eight minutes over. I'm sorry for rushing through the end, but I think uh, we covered the high points. I will turn it back over to Kevin and see if we have any hot questions from the YouTube crowd that I can address. Thanks for the presentation, Richard. I, I'm sure there's a ton of people that'll find this helpful. I learned a bunch of stuff, even though I probably bug you on the norm about it anyway. Um, no worries. But if, if anybody has questions, now is the time to open that up. I know there was one floating out there. Um, this was from Chuck Cole. I think someone answered it, but um, there is it. Hey, Chuck it's in here somewhere is there a software procedure to um where did it go all right there's a bunch of chats for linearity testing is there a software procedure for testing linearity there is uh, the book photon transfer will teach you how to measure uh, linearity um sort of a you know the there's not a built-in, there's not a program that I'm aware of that has a test my linearity, uh, but you can use a flat panel and you can change the integration time uh, to get, you know, basically, you know how much, you know, the signal is twice as much if you expose twice as long. It does require that you carefully calibrate your images. So 
if you take a one second and a five second and a 10 second, you need to subtract the one, a five and a 10 second dark uh, from that. And you should probably take a whole bunch of darks and average that uh, so that you don't actually introduce uh, any noise. Actually, the noise probably isn't going to affect your linearity measure very much. So don't worry about that, averaging a bunch of them. But you should do at least one dark because there's always, if you take a zero expo a length exposure, there's going to be a little bit of signal that we call the offset that you get from the chip. So no signal at all, you're going to get numbers like 400 or 500 or 50. Um, and then when you take a little bit of exposure, you'll get a number that's maybe a little bit more than that. Well, in order to figure out what your counts actually are, you have to subtract that offset. Some cameras have very, very low thermal current and a five and a 10 and a 15 second exposure, the offset's gonna be effectively the same as long as your temperature regulated. Uh, but most cameras uh, aren't like that. So you need to be temperature regulated. You take a series of exposures, measuring uh, the amount of time and making sure that the light coming into the camera is the same. And then you know that uh, you've increased the signal by two. And so with those calibrated images, you measure in the middle and see what the ADUs are. You usually average, uh, you know, some surrounding pixels uh, in the middle. Uh, but that's, yeah, it, it, I, I could outline the whole procedure, but it would take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, but that's basically, that's basically it. And you can I refer you to photon transfer. There's probably, uh, if you Google how to measure camera linearity, I bet you would find some uh, more signal than noise there uh, as, as far as how do it. See if Richard did, did any of that come through? There he uh, kind of broke up there in the end, but I think we got that okay. one covered. Um, the okay. next one's from George Lutch on ADU. Which is better, a higher or lower number? Better for what? Um, the higher the ADU, it means you got more photons, which means you got more signal. So higher is better signal to noise, if that's what you mean. Uh, yeah. I'll see if he writes in for more of that. Um, okay. Uh, did he s okay. Um, Tom Clarkson, having used many cameras, how much variation do you see among CMOS cameras? Given sensor size, are they all about the same? Or say, and then he goes on to say, for 20 second subs, how essential is uh Oh, wait, this is two parts. I'm sorry. Okay. So having used many cameras, how much variation do you see among CMOS cameras given sensor size and about the same? Um, sensor size is all over the place with both. So I would say that's the same. Uh, as far as the quality goes, which I believe was the second question, uh, I see less variation in CCD uh, between the manufacturers Usually, you know, there's 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 read noise improvements. You can definitely see that there's a difference, uh, but it's usually like this is a little bit better than that. Uh, it's not spectacularly huge differences. With CMOS, my experience is it's all over the place, and that's because CMOS astro cameras are still in their infancy. And probably 10 years or 15 years ago, you could say the same thing about CCD. Everybody who's making CCD cameras today has been making CCD cameras for a long time. They know what they're doing. Um, for CMOS, some of the camera vendors are still, it's very obvious, they're still kind of figuring out uh, how to do it. And I do see some wide swings in quality. Uh, same chip, different manufacturers, world of difference in quality. Um, you know, differences in amp noise, differences in uh, build quality of the electronics. I plugged in a guide camera once, I won't tell you who it was, and uh, just just the USB into the guide camera created a ground loop because there was a short and it smoked, you know, something else on my on my imaging chain. Um, so you don't see using that, <laughs> that brand of camera very often. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of variety in CMOS. You know, I guess it, I would say it, it's more or less true that the more you spend, you know, the higher the quality is. I don't know anybody making, you know, $5,000 cameras that are just utter garbage. But, you know, down around the $1,000 or less, there's a lot of variation. Some of those cameras are just trash. And some of those cameras are really quite good. And because I work for a vendor and I have relationships with all these camera vendors, I'm not going to tell you who they are. <laughs> but there is some variation there, uh, you know, 
between them. But I, but I also say I've seen some really huge strides just in the last two or three years uh, between these vendors. So I'm not sure, you know, vendor who smoked my other camera, one of their newer cameras would do that. This was maybe seven or eight years ago. So, you know, bear that in mind. Yeah, companies, you know, when it comes to technology and electronics, there's there's going to be variation, especially under mass production stuff. So you, right. vendors do their right. best to make sure electronics and boards are all ready to go but you know i've yeah i don't I've, know any i don't know any charlatans let's say that there there are people who like to talk about the camera vendors and, and vendors and you know they're all you know they're crooks and they're trying to deceive everybody i find when a camera vendor isn't doing something right uh either i'm mistaken or they are mistaken. Uh, I, I really don't know of any of my fellow vendors that are intentionally doing bad work and trying to get away with it. Uh, and most of them will stand behind their work uh, if you have any have any problems with it. So that's how we do here at Skywatcher. It's like we right. we understand that stuff can and will fail. It's electronics, and it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. And I've seen high-end mounts fail and i've seen low-end mounts perform amazingly it's just you know it's yep. just how it is and no one's trying to pull any fast things over anybody it's just the realist realization of that's how when you add electronics that's just how it works so but it's how the company handles that issue when the issue comes up is where you should probably be paying attention to it so um, couple more questions, uh, two at the moment, uh, I probably know the answer to this one, but you could probably elaborate it more. This comes from Frank Kane. Um, what's the deal with class one versus class two CCD sensors? I know you don't really see that too often anymore, but it used to be a thing. Yeah. So a class one sensor has fewer, every sensor has defects. You can't make uh, 50 million pixels on a sensor and there not be a few defects. Uh, class one sensors, I, I can't tell you exactly what the metric is, but class one sensors have very few defects. Class two sensors have a few more defects. Uh, and then you get what you call engineering grade, which is a sensor that you probably wouldn't want to use, but it works if you're an engineer and you're writing code and you need to read out an image and see that, you know, the image is there. Uh, you don't put engineering grade sensors in cameras that you sell. Usually the cost between a grade two and a grade one sensor is significant. Um, the quality improvement between grade one and grade two is usually not that big a deal. Uh, you'll have a, a bad column is usually not really bad. Uh, what it is is a leak and the leak is repeatable in a CCD anyway. And so all of the pixels in that column are 30, pixel, are 30 ADUs higher than they should be. And when you subtract the dark, that takes that out. Uh, so grade two sensors have uh, flaws that are either easily calibrated out or can be corrected by just doing a dither. And then when you stack with the rejection, it gets rid of it. Gets rid of it. A, grade two a grade one sensor is much cleaner and has fewer of those defects. I do have a grade one sensor uh, in my uh, FLI 16200 and it is very nice. Uh, it, it is very nice. Now I can't make the decision for you. Rather, you know, making sure you calibrate and, and dither is worth three thousand dollars. I'm actually I'm not real sure what the difference in price is, but I can't say the grade one sensors are kind of nice. Uh, it, it's it's really nice. I know Malincam uh, uses only grade one sensors, but Malincam is a completely different uh, workflow. They're doing live stacking and live imaging, and so. You don't have the luxury of, uh, you know, calibrating things after the fact or doing a dither and a stack with reject. A lot of times they're looking at their live data on the camera. And so, you know, using a grade one sensor in those in a camera like that uh, makes a real difference in the user experience. And so that's why, you know, that's why that's sometimes important. I don't know if that helps or not. Grade one's exactly. nice. It, it's it. nice. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Well, that. We've kind of ran over on time, which is fine. Um, this is all recorded, so if any of you want to go back and check it out, you can uh, definitely do that. Um, if there's any questions that you have after the fact or we didn't get to, you can always email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Uh, 
or if you have any topics that you want us to cover in the future, you can email that too as well. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up for this week. Um, next week, we are planning on doing deep sky, um, or I'm sorry, dark sky sites and how to find and locate a dark sky site for you to go observing. Um, I will let all of you guys know my wife and I are expecting in the next week or two. So there is a chance that the things might get shifted over. So if there is a uh, delay and uh, so there might be a gap, a hiatus for a week or two. So um, just a heads up on that. But other than that, once again, thank you all for watching. Uh, my name is Kevin Lagore from Skywatcher and this is Richard Wright from Software Bisque. And uh, if you have any uh, questions for Richard, um, can they email you on your website or would it be better just to email through? Okay, all their information yeah. is on Richard's website. Yeah. Um, or you can email us at support at skywatcherusa.com and we can send it to Richard. So uh, thank you all once again for watching. Have a great weekend and uh, we will catch you next time. See ya. Bye. Happy imaging, blue skies. Hold on just a second.